Hey Jeff. Hey Eric. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you? I am doing all right too. Um, first and foremost, rest in peace to Fred the Godson. Yes. Um, Fred was somebody that we crossed paths with, uh, you know, here and there for the better part of the last decade. Um, I think we always revered him from afar, and the chances that we got to connect were uh, always nice, uh, especially when he knew exactly who we were. Yeah, well, because there were a lot of times where he thought that I was um, Adam from Double XL, right. formerly of Double XL. And so, like, I always appreciated him coming up to me, like, SOBs. and <laughs> um, But then we, we cleared it up, you know, a couple years ago. Yeah, we, we stopped by to see Arsonist from yeah. Heat Makers. And um, we got to be in the studio and hang out and listen to, to new music. And, and in walks Fred the Godson. And it was like, oh, yo, just before we get out of here. Yeah. I'm Jeff, not, you know, And he was Adam. like, yo, and he laughed so hard. And we got to, honestly, we got to talk about... Uh, his Funkmaster Flex freestyle. So he had gone, so this is two years ago, he had gone uh, and done Flex and ripped it. And people can go check that out on YouTube right now. And I, I suggest you do because there's such a difference uh, between anybody who goes up there and, and spits and tries again or cuts it. And you can tell where things are edited and someone who does it in one take. Yeah. And Fred was uh, a genius. And you guys talked about that. You guys we talked did. about how he did it one yeah, take. So we, so yeah. So we watched it together on the phone and we talked about it. And, and it was it was a really cool moment to, you know, we, we love wordsmiths. We love uh, creative minds. And, and to be there and to really get into it with someone in person um, was really special. And I think if you listen to him on, you know, any feature that he did, any, any, you know, original song that he did, but uh, you know, I, I look back at the the joint he did with Jim Jones off yep. Jim Jones's album. There's a, there's a lot of songs out there that that have been uh, played here today as we think about Fred and uh, listen. Um, Love to his family, man. Uh, above above and beyond, uh, that's that's number one. Yeah, but I think that um, there's there's no silver lining in all of this, and I, I I think that there just needs to be a baseline understanding that this can hit anybody we know people who have gotten it who have recovered uh we know relatives who have gotten it and not recovered um and we know people who uh you know want to act like it's not happening it's out there it's real it's a problem it is taking lives and uh i was i was listening back to our episode with officially ice from who knows who knows how long ago a month right. ago maybe yeah and, and he was like, people aren't going to realize until they lose someone close to them or somebody that they look up to. And I think that Fred was both. And um, if you're out there and you love Fred the Godson, do everyone a favor, not just yourself. Stay home. Stay safe. And, um, and, and with that, I think uh, we're looking forward to a really good episode today while we're all here. We got three great guests, Jeff. And we're starting off with... Salam Remy. Salam Remy. The legendary super producer. Yeah. Who we talk about like old New York shit with him. Yeah. We that, talk that about was Miami. Great. Yeah. We talk about Amy Winehouse. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to cover with a guy uh, that deserves an hour and a half just for himself. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the stuff that we really get into, like yeah. the DJs that he like. Oh man. Used to run around with. It's great. It's it's it, it took me back to like a moment that I never even lived. <laughs> like. It, it was so vivid and compelling. Like, I, I would listen to Salam Remy talk all day. Shout out to Salam Remy. And then, Jeff. We talked to Marlon Kraft. From Hell's Kitchen. Yes. I mean, of a different age. He is. Yeah, a different era. Different era. But, yeah. like, I love that he's so intentional. I love that he's so thoughtful in what he says. And just, like, a really smart, driven kid. And you know what? Maybe that's what we need right now and yep. moving forward. So, shout out to Marlon Kraft. And then we talked to Director X. Yeah, that's our man. Director X from uh, Toronto. Director X, a.k.a. Don't, don't Get Me Vexed. Is what he said uh, in the intro to his full uh, episode. That's right. Uh, Director X, one of the great visionaries uh, that we've had in this business. Um, you know, and that's that's a long, long, long career from the Sean Paul stuff to the Drake stuff to, you know, everything that you've seen has been visually basically based on him for yeah. the last 20 years. So shout out to Director X. Um, and we talk about like conspiracy theories. You know what? So, it's it's you know, just like his Instagram live. You I know? love it. I love it. <laughs> All it, right. it takes me to a weird place. But Jeff, before we get into uh, this episode here today, we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash it's the real. Yes. Go there. 
You can even go to Yahoo and just type in Patreon. <laughs> you can it's bing the, it. Yeah, you can bing it. Yeah. You could uh, you could ask Jeeves. If you if you guys believe in in us and the art that we bring on a daily basis, um, if you really rock with the energy that we're bringing to this day and age, if you want to support that, it's very easy. You can contribute like two dollars or three dollars a month. You can contribute as much as like who knows, but it goes up. No, in- I know. Okay, <laughs> I know how much you can. Fifty thousand dollars a month. I think that'll do it. We have different levels, and we have givebacks, and we want to make this worth it to you. Mm-hmm. Um, clearly, we have we have shown that we have something good. We want to keep it going, and uh, with your help, we can make this happen. Patreon.com slash It's The Real. Jeff, let's get on the phone now with... Ask Jeeves. Salam Remy. Beep boop. Boop boop. Bing bong. Hello. Salam. What up? Hello. What's <laughs> happening? How are you? Pretty good. How are you doing? We're, we're hanging in there. We're doing all right. Um, you're from Queens, New York, but you've been living in Miami, Florida for the longest time. And we were interested in what what drew you down there? Uh, what do you like about it these days? And, uh, and, we, and then we want to talk about the future of Miami, considering everything that's going on. But, but what drew you down there in the first place? Um, I came down here in 2001. So it was right after um, 9-11, actually. Mm-hmm. That's when I started the first project here. Um, on October 1st, 90, yeah, October 1st, 2001, I was supposed to start this artist from the UK named is Dynamite's album in mm. New York. Because that's where I was based, had my studios on 54th Street and everything else. And, you know, of course, when the Twin Towers fell on 9-11, her mother was like, no way you're sending my daughter to New York. So I had a kind of a rough year that year. My mom passed, my granddad passed, my mm-hmm. dad was moving out of the country. So I decided to come out here or go you know, on vacation, basically. So I was going to go to Compass Point in Bahamas or there was a studio in Trinidad. And then I was like, you know what? What if something breaks? It's better off I'm in Miami, so then I'm getting tropical, but I'm still on the mainland of America. Yeah. And when we got here, I got a lot done. And I kind of never really left. I, ended up, <laughs> I was eventually shifting. At first, I was, I was gonna I was gonna get a place here, then go back and forth. And every time I would go back to New York, something would happen that just triggered a you know this broke that broke. And I was like, you know what? I can be here. And at the time, also you know a lot of the scene moved here. So I moved here. Uh, Pharrell, Missy, Timberland, yep. Scott Storch was working at that time. Cool and Dre. Yeah. And then I was also working with Ricky Martin at the time. So I was working with a lot of Latin guys that were in town. And, Ricky Martin and Santana, et cetera. And then on the reggae side, Dave Kelly and myself were both here. So it's like somebody could book a trip to New York and end up working with, you know, enough people of whatever it was. And it just, it was a good energy. And I found a creative base that actually uh, kept me working because it wasn't about just being in the studio in the middle of Manhattan. To well, actually make and what, I mean, and what, what studio did you mostly work out of at that time? In New York, I had in, my own studio. But in or but in, in Florida, head. yeah. I um, actually I just set up my own space because I had like a big SSL studio and everything in New York. So I just set up my own space. So like the first Amy Winehouse album, and you know a lot of Ricky Martin and Gwen Stefani's first sessions after she got and stuff. It was all in my studio that I had uh, in downtown, like in the Venetia. And then sometimes I would mix at Circle House. Yeah. Until I ended up getting my own home studio set up. That pretty much you know is the same type of vibe. And do you buy into the idea of um, a certain atmosphere and um, environment uh, playing a part in music? As in, like you know, people go to Paris to record, people go to LA to record. They get these different vibes in different cities. Do you feel that Miami really brings something special to the table? I think it was different. I mean, especially at that time, you know. As far as I was concerned, you know, I was in New Yorker. I wore Tim's or, you know, <laughs> Wait, you wore Tim's in Miami? No, no, no. In my, as far as my music, in two, prior to 2001, yeah, of course, yeah. I was like, I'm in New York. I'm hustling. I live in middle Manhattan. I lived in Midtown. I got a Scully on and a champion sweatshirt and Tim's every day. Like I Super New York. Like a, yeah. a, a construction worker, basically. You know? <laughs> and then when I was able to get outside and then be in relaxed weather in October and still getting the same authenticity in the music that I wanted to make. And, you know, like I made Made You Look in Miami, but it feels so BX. Very, like very New York, yeah. Was. So at the end, end of the day, you know, it was like, the difference of locale was there. The good thing about Miami at that time was it wasn't that expensive to get a flight and you can get an artist to focus. So if I said somebody come in for a week, 
It's like they can go to the beach all morning, they can relax, they can go party all night. But if a professional musician, if we work from noon to eight or nine o'clock, we're supposed to have more than enough good stuff done. And then they can live, you know, in the morning and the nighttime to kind of have stuff to talk about because the club atmosphere, the beach atmosphere, it gives a lot of time for people to reflect and while out. For sure. Yeah. Is uh, are, what's what's your schedule when it comes to like working? Are you somebody who likes to work in the morning? Are you somebody who is more like a night guy? Like, and who's an artist that that matches your schedule like completely? Um, I'm an early riser. Since I moved to Florida, um, you know, especially now, like I mean, my space is like a lot of fruit trees. It's kind of almost like people come to my space and they feel like they're in the Caribbean somewhere. Mm. Like I'm in Jamaica. I'm in Barbados. Like I'm just in another country. But for me, I like to wake up early. That's when I actually get all my ideas, you know, handle all my business, figure out what's together. And some artists like it in the daytime, but some people will start like later in the afternoon and then still be done by midnight. Or some people go overnight. You know, I have different atmospheres in my space. I have a basement space and then I have an upstairs daylight space. So it's kind of like, you know, Mac Wiles would like to be up all night, so he would stay in the basement. Yeah. Because he didn't know what time it was and didn't want to know. Or certain people vibe out in that type of space. And certain people, you know, CeeLo would like to be outside in the daytime and you still feel like you're at the beach, but you're actually at my space. So it kind of works both ways. So considering the times that we're living in now, and I, and I know we're only about 40 days, a little over a month in, so it's hard to sort of like figure out what the future looks like, but a lot of isolation, a lot of people um, doing things obviously within their space, their four walls. Um, a big concern for us, especially in New York, was the loss of, of creating and, and culture, right? And like, you, right. Can't, you can't go to the club, you can't hear new music, you can't feel when a DJ drops a new record, right? Um, and, and also, like, no one's outside creating. You're not getting music videos, you know, anywhere but inside your home. So it was really a, a big question for us as to how people can create moving forward. And since you're living in a town with so much culture, um, you know, Latin culture, hip hop, everything that goes on, people out in the beach, you know, people just cruising, whatever it is. How do you feel like Miami can rebound or can adapt and pivot to create something new out of this? Well, I think it's two sides to it. Um, one is that, you know, unfortunately, but then maybe fortunately, so many people in the last 20 years have become accustomed to email culture mm -hmm. when it comes to creating music. Hey, email me a pack. Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> it's like, you know, basically it's a, it's a digital beat tape. Yeah. And it's like, nah, just send me drums and chords and I'm going to put together five different people's ideas and then have 12 producers on a song. Yep. So it's a lot of the stuff has become so digital, which is not good about it is that people don't really necessarily get produced vocally. It's kind of like whatever they come up with, the producer is kind of like, just like, I'm going to make this as loud as possible. So when it comes out of the email, it's going to be there. So you got a lot of one thing yep. because of the way that it was also being created and then where it was being created for. It was the club, but it didn't give you enough quiet moments to really get quiet music in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, things that emotionally hit you. So I'm really big on having reactions and I was loving to work with artists. And that's really where I get my best. Like some people, it's just like my beats all sound the same. What I do is really bring the best out of an artist. And that's tougher to do when someone's not um, in the same space with you. I basically yeah. let somebody talk and I can listen to the tone of you guys' voices and start making music around your voices that now make your voice. Like I say, the artist is the picture, I'm just the framer. Yeah. So I'm just framing whatever the thought is. So what's happening now is, you know, I've been reaching out and I've actually been working more now because all the artists that, you know, 80% of their income and their time has been spent on shows yep. with 20% in the studio. Now they're all home like, hey, so I do need something. <laughs> what am I going to do? And also all of this indecision. I don't know what's happening. You know, unfortunately, being a New Yorker, I say condolences every day for the last month yeah. and a half. Yeah. And, you know, just being in the space where, you know, it's this massive grief. Now it's the time like, hey, you know what? I need some heartfelt music i need some heartfelt chords yeah i need something that's going to reflect differently i kind of been describing it as when hip-hop couldn't go out anymore so we had hip house mm -hmm. because of the uh stop the violence movement was based upon something it was like hip-hop clubs were shut down so then after that we ended up having 
Wu Tang and Tribe Called Quest mm-hmm. yeah. on the hip hop side because of the fact it was more head bobbers. It was more it wasn't about our house shoot. It's about I'm in my house with my boys and we got a cipher and that's what's going on. I feel like there's gonna be more heartfelt music that comes out of this and you know and across all genres, I think it just works that way. You know, the, the, the music has always been a reflection of the times, the idea that people don't know what it is. And now you're going to see what folks are really made of because of the fact that it's, you know, black music has always been that of a bounce back from a strife. Yeah. yeah. Period. You know, you were just talking about um, New York clubs and how they might not uh, rebound in the same way and how you've seen this before. But what were, what were some clubs that, really like shaped you like i know that like you went to the supper club and i imagine you went to um you know uh club speed like you know cheetah club like all these places can you talk about like what new york club culture used to be like for you well for me i mean i, I graduated high school in 89 so when i got out of high school i went to live with my dad who was managing chunk chill out mm. and fought master flex and frank jugger were his right hand rest so in peace to guy. frank jugger Exactly. So Frankie was go give me some Chinese food and flex with driving. <laughs> and they lived in down the hall. Chuck lived down the hall from me at the time. So he was living in my building. So I would be everywhere with them. So anywhere that if Chuck went to a label to pick up a record, if he's talking to MC Shan, if he's doing anything, I'm there as the other little tag along, 17 years old. And the same thing, my dad was in the business, so I got to see Molly Mall. I got, you know, I've been to Latin quarters. I've been to different places. Mm-hmm. But what happened is... Once Flex started to come up, Flex and I were like A and B. So he knew that, you know, we were both carrying crates. So if he was on the air and those Fun Master Flex on the one and twos, I remember the first day that that was said, I was in the club with him. So when he was in the Muse, Home Base, all these different places, I'd be by the DJ booths. When he was in the Red Zone, Red Zone. When, Puff had, when Puff had the daddy's house, yeah. you know, for the first time with Jessica, First, he was upstairs, and then the only Slick Rick would be in there because he didn't want to be in the crowd. And then we go downstairs, <laughs> and then it's like, now Triple C is not here today, Flex. You got your shot. But I was in the booth watching him, yo, play the creator, you know, play Cypress. Yo, Buster just walked in, played leaders. Mm. Like, I was watching the room, and I kind of have a DJ's mentality, um, even when I'm creating, because I got to see what the DJ saw, and I move like the DJs. And the same, I was working with Bobby Connors because we were all at BLS. Mm. So I would be in the wild pitch parties with Bobby, or you know he'd be playing house music, but then go back to the reggae stuff or whatever we were doing with Supercat. So I, I'm the early, like I say, ninety to ninety four five, probably Tunnel. I didn't really do Club Speed. That's mm-hmm. a little. That's like the generation after me. Mm-hmm. But up until the Tunnel, from Home Base. The Muse, you no, know, the Muse first. Home base, the tunnel, world, the building, mm. Quandos. <laughs> um, what was Amanda? Car wash. Amanda, uh, I forgot Amanda's last name. Party. Amanda Demi's party. Mm. But all those different things. It was just like we saw who are now. You know, the tribe called Quest. You look over, you see Latifah at the world. You look over, you see Daylight. You saw everybody kind of coming up. Buckshot when he had a book bag on the bed. <laughs> um, at home base and then next thing you know it was like how he looked and who got the props and then two years later it was like yo buckshot's here you got to move out the way you know what i'm saying and then smith and weston comes in so it was great because i was entrenched in the scene from the dj booth and at the radio because then flex was in the lump at the radio so i was yeah. the radio see everything was there but it was really a great thing because the record like put it in your mouth yeah but i yeah you know i went to grade school with or junior high school with yeah at the end of the day, that wasn't going to break on the radio. No. It broke in the tunnel. <laughs> where, there was a, where there was a co-ed bathroom, the music was knocking. I remember Ock being like, yo, Long, you got to be here. Watch when it comes on. Big Cat, rest in peace. Yeah. Be like, yo, bring a finger, Big Cat. It's going to be here. We're going to get it going. And, you know, when she starts singing and then when Put It In Your Mouth came on, the whole tunnel felt like the air was like everybody was waving their hands so it just it, it, it did more than the AC could do it was like oh my gosh look what's going on this record's slow it's, it has cusses all over it it's, it's listed content but at the end of the day the club scene broke that record can you, you know what I'm saying the club scene was actually able to do it can you talk about uh, a, a few DJs we're going to name now and, and what made them special? Because um, the first thing that I think of when I think of Big Cap is is not necessarily just New York music. I feel like he was like one of the guys who really brought like the South up to New York, you know, like breaking Little John records, things like that. Right. Can, you, can you can you talk about Big Cap? Can you talk about what made DJ Clark Kent like really God's favorite DJ playing the Red Zone and, and different places like that? And And can you talk mm-hmm. about what makes Funk Flex you know, just turn a room upside down. 
All right, so I saw with Cap. Cap, um, I really met when Flex was doing the Muse, more or less. I think he started coming around and doing different stuff. Before that, Flex had his boy from the Bronx named Kitty O. They used to rock the mic with him sometimes. Frank Jugger wasn't even really touching the mic like that <laughs> at that time. He was just kind of watching and, you know, we were, Frankie, go give me a fucking a Diet Coke. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was like, oh, come on, Flex. I remember just a quick Frank Jugger thing. I remember one time we were walking back to High 97. Frank was full of jokes. And we were coming from the McDonald's that was on Broadway and 42nd. Mm-hmm. And I was taking my time walking across the street. And it was supposed to have been about 1.30 in the, in the morning. And Frank looked at me and said, Salam, if you don't move, there's going to be a plaque in the street right there that says, <laughs> they lie, big Salam. He wasn't fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> and to this day, that's the first thing I think of. Whenever I would see Frank, I'd be like, they lie, big Salam. He goes, he wasn't fast enough. That was our thing. But big Cap, um, rest in peace as well. Cap had that energy with his voice. You know, there's a lot of different people who, you know, would do the different mixtape thing. But if you know, even if you listen to Flex's uh, radio talking loud voice, mm-hmm. what Frank Jigger was doing, a lot of that was Cap's energy. Mm. Cap had a almost like a nasally tone, big Cap, <laughs> supreme, bigger, bigger, big Cap. You know what I'm saying? It was like I actually put him on a Buckshot La Funk remix I did for No Pain, No Gain because mm. he just had that certain tone. I used him on the beginning of Nasty. Cap just had a thing with him. And as a DJ, he was a cool DJ. You know, you all the stuff with Biggie throwing water at him and being mm-hmm. mad. But Cap <laughs> had the energy. Cap, Cap would get the stage ready for Biggie because he just sounded like this is what it needs to be. He was New York's answer to DJ Cool mm. or any of the Go Go DJs, DJ Flex. Mm-hmm. He had, you know, yeah, pre the Little John stuff. He was definitely rocking with different things. But Cap's energy and his voice. There wasn't nothing better than that. And that's really what made the tunnel. Big mm. Cap Funk Flex. Mm-hmm. Flex really on the mic. Cap really holding that mic down. Flex, Flex really on the, on the DJ set. Yeah. Cap holding the mic down. And that was the thing. Clark <laughs> on another 10. Clark's time, you know, Red Zone Clark did somewhat with Kid Capri and stuff. But Clark's time when people really saw him in lights on another level was Powerhouse. Mm. Which was uh, Patrick Moxie, yeah. um, Patrick Moxie, who owns Ultra and used to own Payday. He had Payday, and then him and Jessica uh, Rosenblum yep. got together and did Powerhouse. And Powerhouse was on 26th Street. It was a club called The Building. It was 26th Street, and it was almost all glass. I feel like they might have had it in the movie. I don't know if it was in Juice or New Jack City. One of them, they showed the inside of this club. Mm. But you almost felt like you were walking across like a factory with different tears to get across yeah yeah so where the dj booth was set in powerhouse that's where i saw clark glow up i know he'd been around and done different stuff and you know dj for day to day and everything else but that was the time where k capri and clark it was like k capri of course his span you know his stephanie mills records whatever else he would throw on but clark was the jam master j on steroids he really looked like a superhero Man. while he was doing what he was going to do and that's really what I could say with Clark, like it, it was a thing where you not only felt the music, but he did it with poise and the way he would look while he was doing it, the way his beard was falling and just his whole, <laughs> I felt like he always wore white or something. It was just the way it was coming across. It just looked like he was glowing. Like, did he just do that? Mm. Was that his real hands or was it like superhero hands? Was that a flash of lightning I saw? Like, I don't know what I just saw. That's how I felt when you were listening to him, DJ. And like I said, he did the red zone and did different stuff before he moved around. But really, the powerhouse, that was like, oh, snap, Clark Kent is here and yeah. everybody better move. And um, that was really his thing. And of course, he continues to do everything with the originals and absolutely. You know, went on to do many other things. But that's when I could say Clark had the city on lock on another level because that club, there was nothing touching it at that moment Yo, at all. Shouts and, to and the originals. Um, you know, they ESPN and Netflix have this new documentary that's uh, about um, Michael Jordan and the Knicks in the '90s. I, I'm sorry, the, the Bulls. Bulls. Yeah, I, I have the Knicks on the brain. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I do not right. like the Bulls in the '90s, and so I'm not talking about the Bulls. But um, but did did you ever see like Michael Jordan play? Did you ever like go to Knicks games? I imagine you're a Knicks fan. I was a Knicks fan. I am a next Knicks fan. Um. You know, I, I got heartbroken with the Knicks, you know, because we were going all the way there. Like yeah. the Starks, you know, the Anthony Mason, the yep. Charles Oakley, the yeah. Patrick Ewing. Yeah. The energy of it, of taking it all the way to the hole. And then, you know, Lauren had a song on, had, had a line on a song said, 
the serpent plays tricks, runs game like the Knicks gas you up to lose the championships. Oh. Oh. Like those mid nineties uh heartbreaks right there. Yeah. I don't think I've ever recovered from them. And I always want the Knicks to be like, all right, cool, we can get the Knicks going. But it was just, you know, to see Starks dunk on Jordan yeah. and posterize him, it was just like, yes, Starks can do it. We can do it. <laughs> but when it came to crunch time, they didn't move military and they moved like, oh, man, we lost it. And it just was like, uh, you know, Patrick, go sit on and eat rice on peas. <laughs> <laughs> it, was like, it was almost like, what's going to happen right now? So that was the heartbreak. You know what I'm saying? Like, just figuring out what that other piece was going to be. Hold on. There was one more DJ you asked me about, too. Oh, Funk Flex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Flex. All right, cool. Yeah, so, I mean, definitely, I, I didn't actually see Michael Jordan play in person, but I definitely saw the, the energy in the Knicks, and I felt it with the city and everything else. Back so, to Flex quickly. Yeah. I just, just, just to roll that out, just because I know him more than anyone else, um, you know, inside out. And the thing is with Flex is two things. One is he's tenacious. Flex would get home. We would leave the tunnel or wherever at 4 a.m. He would drop me off. He would head up the West Side Highway. By 7 a.m., he's still up coming up with routines for the next week. Mm-hmm. He would always push ahead. Like, you know what? I'm going to play Michael Jackson. Da, 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 and then do this. What you think? All right, now nah, I got the idea. I'm going to work on it some more. He would work, 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 and didn't care whatever else was happening. He would spend all of his own money. Funk Flex, the franchise, was born because when Hot 97 first was starting to be a hip-hop station, yep. he spent his own money to do commercials and to put his picture on buses. He did that. Like, spent 30, 40, 50 grand out of his own pocket. Yeah. So he would always stand ahead. He would do parties for free. And I think he's at that point now. Sometimes, like, you know what's up? Oh, you want to do that? Yeah, I want to DJ at a party for free because I want to be there in the spot, making sure I can push it forward. And, you know, the whole idea that someone in our age group wouldn't understand little TJ. I'm finding out about some of these younger artists because he's doing parties with them. Mm -hmm. He doesn't care about everybody saying, well, this is only what I like. Yes, I like Dust Beats. I love Apache. I love Break Beats. But he's also watching what the kids are liking and what's coming up. And that's what keeps him on the edge where a lot of people get to a certain point, you know, usually in their 40s and they shun away whatever happened before what's happening right now he's going to embrace it and that's why he, he can't be stopped and i'm he i think somebody's going to try eventually but he's going to have to slow down for them to catch up because they'll just work all day yeah i think that that what gets lost a lot of the time is that flex really loves it you know i think that people can focus on the western beef commercial or the um you know or <laughs> like the car show or like different other things beyond the music but flex really loves music that's it. He, he loves what he does, and then he loves being there, and he also wants to see what's happening. And, you know, he might not love an artist, but hold on, that record's working? Mm. No, I need to play it twice or three times because he's working for that reaction, and he will spend his, all his money and he'll spend all his energy just to make sure that the impression was there. And, you know, when you aim to please at that level, it's hard for someone to get around you who's focused on a dime. How about um, another person that's very close to our heart and uh, really is you know, the voice in New York, Angie Martinez. The same with Angie. You know what happened? You know, for me, it was like there was times when there was uh, Flex, Angie, and myself were the only people around many nights at Hot Seven when it first started. So I would be there kind of helping Flex do stuff. And then Angie was the board op at first. Mm -hmm. And then they used to be like, yo, Angie, crack the mic. Yo, what's up, Angie? You doing good? Because there's nobody else in the station. <laughs> we had, you know, the overseer salon, Flex, and Angie. And when Angie's um, voice got on the mic and she was able to be that, she also was the young Puerto Rican girl from New York who understood the culture and was at the station when they were still playing TKA records or other things that were happening. Mm. But she understood where it was headed and was a hip hop head. You know, she could say, you know, you say it's working or lines out of Beach Street or something. She's going <laughs> to say it back for you. She could say all the words. Angie knows all the lyrics of Native New Yorker. So yeah. <laughs> it's just like, you know, at the end of the day, her, um, her attachment to the city was that of being one of the city. And then, you know, I would always tell her, like, everywhere I went around the country, post Angie Martinez, there was a Cherry Martinez, there was a something Martinez. Yeah. <laughs> there was some other version of Angie Martinez that still exists. And, you know, that was something 
for you know before that it was almost like we had sue simmons on television and then there was a new mold you know there was a certain type of voice that had to sound like a grown woman on the radio yeah well hot 97 was young hip-hop radio and she seemed to have the voice of what was at that point so for that and then you know her ability to really be in the right places and taking those chances running to go talk to Q- tupac when you know it was a risky thing or going to different places and really asking the questions that needed to be asked yeah you know that's kept her in a certain light but also you know those times the 90s as far as where hip-hop went from being a new york thing to a worldwide business thing um they, you know, Flex and Angie were definitely the voices and still are. Yeah. You know, just, I, I'm blessed to be able to say, you know, those two and as well as Bobby Combs are the three people that I was around like in the early 90s that still have their respective positions in New York radio. Yeah. Um, you know, I, w- I was doing a, some light research before we got on this call and I, I saw that you used to go to this one restaurant with Amy Winehouse down in Miami. Um and I was wondering what your best meal was with Amy Winehouse. Uh, in general, we used to do uh, that. What would she get? I felt like she used to get the the grilled shrimp with yellow rice mm. and plantains. Um, this restaurant is called Garcia's. It's like on North River Drive. Not as a lot of fancy restaurants on that block, Sea Spice and other stuff. But Garcia's was the homegrown. You can go there. It's on the river. And my studio was not far away, and we would eat that maybe two or three times a week. So it was like our regular thing. Even like, you know, in, was it in my bed? Yeah, in my bed was originally called Yellow Rice when we <laughs> first started it. Um, because of, you know, what am I going to call it? Just call it Yellow Rice till I figure out what's some word. <laughs> and, you know, that was part of it. But that was definitely part of, you know, our energy that we would be there all the time. And there was one waiter who always used to look at her like, hey, how you doing? And give her the extra wink. <laughs> and once, you know, she was Amy Winehouse of international fame, he's like, hey, that girl that you used to come here with. And I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> now to this day when I walk in I, I get whatever table I want <laughs> like, hey used to bring tell him tell him who used to come here she didn't want us to come here it's a big deal but Garcia's is one of the things that made me move to Miami it was just like you know wow I can be out here in November sitting on the river in the afternoon eating the fresh fish that was just caught off a boat mm. oh why am I in the cold again <laughs> um nah, so man. Salam a lot of people now uh, are going back to catalog music and listening to certain records for comfort to get them through these times. Are there any uh, albums or specific records that you have on repeat right now? Um, hmm, that's a good one. I mean, in general, my life is old school and on repeat. You know, I keep Marvin Gaye. Uh, Dennis Brown, mm. uh, Donny Hathaway, music near me all the time. Sometimes I go to James Cleveland, the Clark Sisters on the gospel side. Mm-hmm. I keep these things that, you know, I'm trying to make my Aunt Esther's potato salad and my grandmother's candy gams. Mm. Like, you know, whatever is comfort food and yeah. takes me back to that place is there. Um, and then now I'm actually just been writing a lot of music that's taking me there. Because normally what I do um, is I've been living in Miami where it's kind of like New York springtime all year round for mm-hmm. the most part. So then I wait until the first day of spring and then I show up with new music and that's where Come Through and Chill comes from. Mm. And that's where, you know, the energy of All I Want Is You is mm. that first spring day when people get to go out to the village and they don't have to wear their jacket and it's like, hey, <laughs> it's new love. It's A. Marie season, as I tell her all yeah. the time. <laughs> as soon as A. Marie season starts, it's why don't we fall in love? So I was excited and I was looking, I was like, hey, I'm going to New York with some new wait a minute, let me take a look here and let me wait and then I pump faked it. But I'm just, I'm actually trying to create music that just feels like all the classic energies that I want to get. You know, the heartbeats, the uh, baby I'm scared of you, Womack and Womack. You know, mm. a lot of times on my Instagram, I'm posting music 98% of the time. Um, and it's really just to remind myself that there's 30 seconds that can totally change your mood. Absolutely. And when you hear the right song for 30 seconds, it totally change your mood. Well, those are the songs that I aspire to make and that, you know, us as creators should be inspiring to make. Because just like if you see a headline, it's going to make you smile or frown and then you're going to want to read the story. Yeah. Well, yeah. If you get a little bit of a song, that intro hits you and then you now want to do a spin, it can totally change your day. And a lot of times people hit me like, hey, you know what? No, that song you posted actually got me in my feelings. And it's like, well, great, but that's how the music was supposed to make us feel. Like yeah. it's supposed to give us something. And you know, to get through these tough times, definitely, you know, you know, cl- 
club quarantine was a big thing as yeah. far as D. You know, the way I saw it was authentically just like, you know, I'm going to play some music. All I do is play music. I'm in L.A. by myself. and just play some music. Yeah. And then people tapped into it like, wait a minute. This is what I want to hear. This is what I wish I could do. But also, you know, it's a time when, like I said, the, the greats, you know, the what's going on is going to get made now. The other things mm. that actually touch your soul and, you know, the voices that actually resonate. I'm looking for those things to be coming out of this and to help us through the rest of the year because this month is one thing this year is going to be something else yeah yeah well salam this has been an absolute pleasure yeah um you know i'm looking forward to doing like a full episode of our podcast with you um and you know when we're allowed to travel and we're allowed to go and have people over to our apartment um sure. but this has been awesome and uh we love you uh we're gonna be checking in on you and yeah. uh, and be well in the meantime well thank you i'll be hiding away and you know I, i've been saying as a joke not a joke I wonder if 90% of the people know that they'll never see me again. Okay, it's great. Well, I'll be on the phone and I'll be FaceTiming you from whatever dessert remote island I can find <laughs> to barbecue on. But um, I'll send pics. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tom. So, um, cool. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot. Jeff, let's now get on the phone with Marlon Craft. Beep, 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 boop, boop, boop. Yo, yo. Marlon! What's good? What's good? What's, what's going on? What's happening? How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm holding up. You know, how are you guys doing? How we're doing we're doing all right. Thank you very much. You know, uh, you've been uh, pretty out there about how you've suffered through anxiety uh, throughout your life. How are yeah. you approaching and living through these particularly unique times? Man, it's like I, I it's like one day at a time, you know, is the only way to really do it. And that's what I'm I'm learning and trying to work on. It's it's whenever I kind of like look at the big picture of it and how long things might be or whatever it is it gets overwhelming so i'm trying to like find myself in like a little routine and kind of lose myself in each day and uh, not think too too big picture you know what i mean which is a luxury because i don't have kids or anything so i can do shit like that but um it's tough man no for sure and i think i think anybody uh who you know day in and day out sees the news or or thinks about the fact that like you know, uh, it becomes stay at home until the 30th or the 15th or the next month. I, it, it could be a lot. And sometimes you just need to do, you know, what you can and figure out that you can only control what you can control and be in the moment. Yep. Yep. And I think like, you know, I'm trying to use it as an opportunity. I mean, it's hard because <laughs> the things that always help with my anxiety are like getting outside, getting a lot of like sun and then engaging with other people a lot. <laughs> and I can't yeah. do any of those things, but I'm trying to like work on, um, you know, like just even the things that I'm not spending a lot of money on food. So I finally like copped up on like the headspace meditation app for like the annual. Oh, dope. Shit. dope. So I'm like, so I'm like diving into that and trying to get my meditation on. And then I'm, I'm just, I'm just diving full full throttle into this art and this music and this content and just trying to like let that be my my outlet like it's always been and and kind of try to be there for people at this time too like I make that connection through music with a lot of my fans and people that listen to me so I feel like now is the time if anything to to saturate a little bit more and try to be mindful of the times for people and give people something to listen to you know Yeah by the way um the the guy who does the Headspace app he was on Instagram Live with John Legend uh, in the beginning of uh, quarantine. quarantine. Yeah, and uh-huh. it's very weird to see a face <laughs> with that yeah. dude's voice. Like it, it totally like threw me off. I was like, oh, like there's a real person, not just like a, an animation. Oh, it's the dude who who's like the voice on the app. It's that yeah. guy. Yeah, like it, but oh. like he's also like the guy. Like he owns the app, and it's his voice. And he's the Yo, most calming person. That's so fire. I don't know if I would like uh, prefer to see him or prefer to imagine him as this non-human actor that just speaks to me like calmly. Like, like I don't know if it would like break the wall. Like you know what I'm saying? Oh, it'd be sure. too weird. It's it's imagine him like at the grocery store. <laughs> like yeah. the, it would totally break me out of whatever <laughs> I was trying to do. Just right. hearing this dude's voice, just being like. I would like some yogurt. <laughs> yeah, I was going to be like, can I, 
have changed for 20. <laughs> <laughs> um, Marlon, uh, we've seen you throughout the years uh, and, and seen what you've cultivated with your supporters, whether that's like the Live from the Hell's Kitchen series, whether it's selling out SOBs, uh, whether it's doing an album release with uh, Halal Guys on 53rd. Uh, how do you approach work these days and, and how do you stay in touch, like in, in active touch with a fan base that you can't necessarily see in person? Yeah, man. So we've just been trying to do everything that, that we can. And I've always been a believer in, you know, cultivating smaller groups. Like we always want to make the the biggest audience that we can and get everything out to the biggest audience that we can. But I just remember like when I was coming up before I even got a real following of my own, I remember like the rollout for the J. Cole Forest Hills Drive album yeah. in 2014. And I remember when he was like driving around to like different diehard fans' cribs and like letting them hear the music first. Yep. Um, and I always just thought that that was really powerful because he couldn't do that for everybody, but everybody that followed that really was like a devout fan knew that that could have been them. And so it kind of like, it, it kind of was plural and it's like in its singularity. So I've been I've been trying to do like the big outreaches and the lives and whatever, but I've been doing these weekly happy hours where we pick fans like out of this, you know, like a uh, contact list that we have of diehard fans and we pick like 30, 40 fans and do these Zoom sessions with just me and those fans, every different fans every week and doing like I've been playing them just new shit and talking to them and and, hearing, and taking questions and just chopping it up. Um, so, you know, and then just trying to be there on the content side, like I dove in and made a whole new, uh, EP that is, you know, like catered to this context and I'm trying to get this out, get it out for people as fast as possible. So oh, super dope. I yeah. So just like trying to, trying to, I, I like, you know, in the first couple of weeks, it was weird. It's like, everyone was like, all right, streaming is down. Like all the industry talk was like, you know, streaming is down and bigger artists are looking like they might wait stuff out. Ba ba ba, and to me, I was just like, man, like nah, like this is when yeah, at you least flood the, the market, music, yeah, yeah, the type of music that I make, I just feel like it's the responsibility of the artist. You know, it's like, are we, are we artists or are we uh, sound uh, manufacturers? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. like you know, so like I'm I fuck with that by the way. <laughs> Yeah, I, I feel like I'm a sound manufacturer. <laughs> <laughs> I think that nah. I think that these times now, you know, you get a lot of uh, you know hope with with the fact that artists can use their voice in a in a certain way and provide something that will you know be a measure of calm for people or an understanding for people who may not be able to uh, you know uh, necessarily do that themselves. Yeah, yeah, man. I mean, it's 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 kind of like reaffirming in some ways uh to the role of the artist in society because i think a lot of the times you know we don't you know there's not a lot of money in music until there's a lot of money in music right. and especially when you want to do it the way that I, i've tried to do it and and with a focus on like authenticity and like making authentic real shit and it's kind of like it's reaffirming that yo at this time where like i still have value like the invaluable nature of what we do is like being highlighted right now in the sense that a lot of times it feels undervalued because of how it's kind of invaluable. But now, now it's, it's like clear that it's like, yo, I still have concrete value. Like I can't be fired. And in fact, people still really want my, like to hear what I'd contribute. So, you know, in some, in whatever small way, um, it's affirming that, you know, we as artists contribute something, intangible to people and to me it makes me want to uh, try to produce more and not less you know what i mean do you ever like maybe in a moment early on think to yourself like oh my god i don't know my value or i don't know where art stands when there's like death out there or when there's like you know a sort of reshuffling of of what matters do you ever think about that does that strike you as an artist yeah, yeah, like in the beginning, so like we had the the Mom's Whiskey song with Code of the Friend, right? and it was like slated to release and everything, and I was very, very, I mean, we had a whole project that we pushed back, so like that that song was supposed to be the first drop of this eight-song EP um, that we were really excited about. I mean, I had like Plain Pad on it and wow. No Mind on it and all these people, and and uh, as well as most my, my regular people that I work with, and, and it was it was like immediately we were after a week or two we were just i was just like yo we have to push this back because this is not 
this the temperature and the mood of this project is not fitting of the times yeah and it's just not appropriate to be like in kind of triumphant um salesman mode a little bit with a rollout when when this is what's what's going on and even with that song i was like particularly i remember i like asked the fans i was like do you guys want this song because it was weird waters it's like you don't want to be at the same time as i realized the value that i have it's also like you know people like you said people are dying like i'm not on the i'm not an essential worker right. you know what i'm saying like it's like the it's like there's this weird disconnect with art it's like for sure how much value really is there so so but it seemed but overwhelmingly what i heard from you know people like the supporters were just like yo we want music oh for you sure know, that's what we want so i was like you know all right cool let me let me go something that make something make a project that feels like right now and not in the sense that like all the lyrics are all like we in the quarantine right, man, right, bored, right. Uh, <laughs> but just like the mood the vibe the temperature you know what i mean yeah so um you know you are someone who has grown up in new york you have you know i mean like what's something that as the world is changing around us and we see that like new york is gonna be so completely different in the future what's like the most like granular small thing that you think that you'll miss from uh the pre-covid world man yo it's hard it's hard to say because i just don't know like what it's gonna look like you know but it's funny because i mean i was having this conversation a couple times the past few days like i don't know what new york is gonna look like because culture was already kind of dying yeah culture in general and like mom and pop business was already dying in new york and this is kind of probably just escalated that like 20 years ahead you know what i mean it's like it's just like i wonder what it's gonna look like is it gonna be just completely vapid of culture and corporate because the only people that are gonna be able to reopen businesses are like have corporate money or is it gonna be like a lot of people that gentrified and moved in are gonna move out to the suburbs now because new york is more of a hot spot and there's gonna be like this cultural renaissance because in this climate of like trauma and distress is going to be like the original people that are here are, are going to be so look, I'm, I'm interested to see and frankly like hopefully maybe be a part of the latter but i i it's just hard to say I, but what i i mean I'm just, i just miss like the energy of new york and people and like being outside on a simple level man like yeah. you know well by the way so yeah. like you know like you were just saying i actually feel more optimistic you know to the to the second point that you made you know, I feel like a lot of people are going to move out. I think a lot of companies are going to move elsewhere. I think a lot of the money that was here for the um, the Bloomberg and even Giuliani years is going to disappear. And so yeah. we're going to see this sort of maybe bombed out return to, quote unquote, authentic New York. And, you know, we're going to see what's going to happen. I think that that is just like an interesting time. Well, I, and I had I had a discussion with our mom, I think yesterday she she read a piece in the, in the Times about how, uh, you know, it was going to take a, a long time to get back to quote unquote normal, right? Like who knows what the new normal is going to be. But our mom was was like, you know, the, the New York that she loves in terms of like museums or ballet or, you know, culture for her is is not going to return back necessarily in the way it was but what i said to her was you know the dancers are not going to go anywhere they just have to adapt and present it in a new way and i think if you look at you know hip-hop and how it was born out of literally the bronx is burning you know and out of necessity there was culture and art created i think that serves as a hopefully a model for what we can do moving forward yeah man i mean it's it's funny like it's like the game is kind of like half style and half substance and now a lot of the style is being removed in the sense of like the playing field's a little bit even people first of all they want substance but second of all if you're not substantive or innovative creative in your form or or in your business for that matter then like you're not going to be able like like even with shows right like the dancers in the ballet but with shows it's like when shows start happening again who knows when right they're not going to be mosh pit like whatever it's going to be like spread out like let's go catch this vibe and actually listen to the music you know like how many performers are ready for that model oh yeah well that but that's the that's the crazy thing though right because it's just like 
if you're not interacting with the music in like a real physical way, then are you really interacting with it? Right. And, and I mean, I, to me, it's like what I, where I go with it is, I mean, it's just going to be interesting. It's just going to be different, not necessarily better or worse, but I've been to so many shitty rap shows where we all know it's like, yo, it's not about what's actually happening on the stage or what it sounds like. It's about the energy in the room. Yeah. Right? You know? And I, I, I feel like, you know, but I, I like personally, my favorite ones are the, the combination of both. And I've always tried, like I always play with a live band in New York and I've always tried to cultivate that type of thing. I, I feel like equipped to do a show in any setting where if it's like, okay, I get the band and I could just play it for you and we could be spread out, you know what I mean? And it could sound, and we could have this vibe. Um, but I know when the, when the, when the song with the 808s comes, there's no like, all right, ready, one, two, three. <laughs> like, like, you know what I'm saying? I, it's it's going to be, it's all going to, it's like all about adaptability, you know, as, as an artist and I guess as a business, as a business too. But, I, but I'm with you in that. Like, I think there's some hopefulness to, I mean, this, you know, we're in the world of art and I, and I feel like the best moments for creatives in American history have always come out of, turmoil for sure marlon when did you personally figure out and realize that your voice had power that's a great question um i think it's gradual you know um but i think i think you know when you start getting those messages from people like early on um that are like even when like before i had like a ton of fans um or i was you know those messages that are like yo this song really really helped me get through this tough time or like i'm going through this in my life and this song helped me or this song saved my life and blah 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 i was gonna do this i think that's when you really start to see start to feel that shit um because for some reason it's like i don't know we I feel like the micro is more digestible for us a lot of times. Mm-hmm. So it's so it's kind of like when someone's personally just like, bro, I needed this to get over this. And it's like, damn, this shit matters. You know what I mean? What yeah. I say to yeah. a lot of people. And um, yeah, I think and I think both can be true. You know, I think as artists, what's tricky is we don't always like we're asked to kind of ignore a lot of shit because it's cool. And that's okay and there's room for stuff and i like all different types of music and i grew on i'm not with like everything being some jolly informative rap session like this is art right you know but but at the same time it's like we can't act like when a kid says yo this song saved my life because it made me think about this this and that differently there's always balance in life absolutely so the opposite the opposite can be true like when we're we're telling kids do this do that you know feel like this feel like that you know, it, this, it goes both ways. So it, it made me think about that power in the sense of, yo, if, if, if this can affect people positively. And so where I kind of land with that is because you can't get into like this overthinking of uh, everything I do. And I have to sanitize myself. But for me, it's like it better be true. And that's kind of like my whole vibe with all artists in general is like, yo, it better be true, man. Like if you're talking about killing people and doing whatever you're doing, man, like if I, if I believe you, then it's art, bro. And that shit can be beautiful. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. that shit comes at a cost. So if it's not true, then don't put, don't put inauthentic toxicity out into the world, you know? Yeah. I feel like, um, I, I just want to say like how happy I am to be having this conversation, especially like we're pairing this with uh, our conversation with Salam Remy, mm-hmm. and mm. it really hits on some of the same notes where you're, you know, you, you want art that means something as opposed to commercial or commercialized um, sort of like nothingness, you know, like I, I think that it, it it's, it gives me sort of hope for like, you know, what comes out of this. Yeah. I do want to say, though, I had one more question and it is a little bit commercial. That's so, fine. So pardon that. But <laughs> no, nah, good. listen, when <laughs> when you did Flex and when you did Sway, um, that's not commercial. Well, I, by <laughs> definition, it sort of is, you I mean, know, sure. But yeah. uh, when, you, when you did both of those, uh, were you nervous beforehand? And uh, what was it like in the moment? Yeah. Yeah. Um, First of all, Salam Remy is a legend. I'm very uh, flattered and humbled, and that's fire. Um, second of all, uh, yeah, man, I was I was 
nervous as hell. I'm nervous as hell for just about any performative like thing. Yeah. Um, until I get into a rhythm, you know, like on tour, a few shows in, then it starts to be like the amount of time of nervousness before each thing gets shorter. So it's like yeah, yeah. today I was only nervous for ten minutes before I went on. Did I? Right. But um, I I was I was I was od nervous. But you know what's funny? So it was kind of different for both. So on Sway, when I went on Sway and and head to the Five Fingers and everything. My whole career, and I, I'd been on Sway once before as part of like a cipher. Yep, I'd yep, I remember that stuff. Yeah, and I, I, I was used to this role of like, I roll like, who the fuck are you? What are you about to do? You know, and then prove everybody, you know, wrong yep. type of thing. Really, for my whole life. Yeah, that was the first time that I walked in a room, and as soon as I came in the room, we're off air, and Sway comes to me, he's like, "Yo, your album." like is incredible sir like this is an amazing like you did a great job and he starts like quoting lines from like deep cuts on the album and like direct and i'm like could tell he really listened to it and i have such reverence for him that i was just like yo and the whole the whole interview was just like they were just really fucking with me and showing me so much love and so when the freestyle came i was like i was actually mad nervous because I had gotten used to that energy, that underdog <laughs> energy, and that like that like yo, you up, don't let us down. Yeah, right. Energy yeah. is the different energy, yo. <laughs> like that shit is like. Very, I was like, yo, I hope I don't let y'all down. Like I almost said it out loud. Like I was like, damn. So 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 that was you know that was that the flex thing. Um, I was mostly just mad nervous because I was waiting forever. Like we got there, like I, I try to break the rapper stigma and like I'd be like, <laughs> show, I'd be showing up on time for right. shit. And uh, they had uh, who was there? Uh, I don't know. I can't remember his name right now. He's like a a battle rap guy from Jersey. Uh, oh. Arsenal, Arsenal. Was oh there. yeah, oh. yeah. Mm-hmm. And and he w- he went before me. So, but I, we were there from like, I don't know, we were there for like three hours, like we're just waiting. So Jeez. I started to get kind of, kind of nervous. But yeah, because you're I like got, iced out. Yeah. And I was so tired though. The thing is you can only be nervous for so long and then you're just like dead. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I kind of was like, but, and it was like three in the morning. So by the time I, it kind of worked because by the time I went to rap, I was like, yo, I'm not even nervous no more. Like, let's just get this shit <laughs> over. But when he you starts know? like growling in your ear, <laughs> does that, does that throw you off at all or? nah man like yo the thing is with those like my my performance thing to because i always had anxiety so i always was like yo my whole thing was i'm gonna practice this so many times that no matter what happens or how nervous i get i know i'm gonna like it's gonna be like muscle memory yeah yeah like you know so i had i had practiced that so many times and i'd been wanting to be on those shows for years for sure i've gone gone through the whole salty underground rapper phase of being like why don't they let me on the platform and so I had just decided, like, yo, if they're giving me time, that, that that's what they're giving me. So I'm going to just be overprepared. And I actually had a whole other, uh, like, two and a half minutes on the flex verse that I was going to do over a trap beat because I had wanted to switch up beats because I saw the Corday shit. Yeah. And I was like, yo, I'm trying to outdo whatever everybody's saying is the best. So I was trying to go in and out of a trap tempo and, um, and flex – was wasn't having it he was just like nah you can only do one beat and i was like can i just do two because i want to switch and he was like nah so but um but yeah i had some more man well i mean if you want to do it right now (laughs) (laughs) yo marlon before we let you go uh what can you give us any information the name or or when your ep is coming out anything about it yeah so it's called work from home um and uh I hope nobody steals that shit before <laughs> I put it, before I get it in the system. Right, but, right. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be called Work From Home. Basically, like me and uh, my producer that I've been working with for years, his name's Arbus Beats. He lives in Sweden, wow. and I actually met him from searching Joey Badass type beat into YouTube <laughs> yeah. in like like five years ago, and I just reached out to him, and we That's flew dope. him out to work on Funhouse Mirror, um, and he, me and him, like so we kind of been working from home from a long for a long time obviously and we when this happened he had, we had had some joints in the cut and then i was just like yo send me beats bro i'm just i'm just i'm locked in the crib and we just were working 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 and and he produced the whole thing and so I, i've been sending sessions around though. i got other people playing on it i got sax like i got sax on it because i sent it to my boy and he's at his crib recording sax stems sending them back that's dope and like you know shit like that so everyone's like just sending stems all around um, and yeah, it's it's gonna come out hopefully you know in the next like four to six weeks. I'm trying to I'm trying to push it out 
um, so people can have it. And then we're, we're going to do this, uh, this work week thing um, in conjunction with that kind of leading up to that, which is, um, you know, my, my hours organization, which is kind of like the community engagement brand extension of, of me and, and what I try to do with the fans is, uh, you know, we had done uh, this nonprofit collaboration last year where we got a grant and contributed and did these three events. We're going to do a digital one this year where we're going to be donating uh, $8,000 um, to relief efforts and it's probably going to go towards uh, the equipment for nurses and stuff. And we're trying to get that matched and exceeded by brands. And then we're going to be doing all these online events. And then we're also going to be collecting, doing like a fundraiser, but sort of for art. So we're trying to, we're trying to Very hit awesome. a number of 365 pieces of art, whether it be like, you know, a painting, a drawing, a verse, whatever it is, with the goal being that like, you know, art has value in these times. We need that to help us get through and hopefully we'll have enough to post one a day for the next year. Um, very, very through. awesome. Yeah. So that's, so that's, so that's all coming up hopefully in the next four to six weeks, all of that, you know, that we're trying to rush as fast as yeah, we can. Yeah. I mean like, well, I appreciate you, uh, you know, raising funds for art and, and artists. I also appreciate you, um, you know, bigging up uh, sound manufacturers. That's right. Um, <laughs> sound manufacturing. That's how we move forward. Listen, uh, stay true. Stay uh, stay creative out there. Stay safe. And uh, Marlon, we'll look forward to everything you got coming down the pipeline. All right. Oh, yeah. I appreciate you guys, man. Thanks for having me. And now, Jeff, let's call up to Toronto, Canada and get on the phone with Director X. Bing bong. Do you think people... Sorry, hold on. Let me pause that. Do you think people realize have they have they seen the uh, the change in in ringtone yet? I think it's because he's in Canada. <laughs> yeah, it's different. <laughs> it's a different one. Sorry, let me try it again, Jeff. Uh, let's get on the phone now with Director X. Beep boop bonk bonk bonk. <laughs> X, what up? What's up? What's happening? How are you? Uh, you know, just uh, just. Watch Netflix through the apocalypse, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you know, like, uh, I think that's sort of the attitude we all have to have, where it's just like, listen, something's happening outside, we just have to stay inside. Yeah. Have you gone through everything in Netflix and sort of, like, moved on to Hulu and Amazon and just, like, are you struggling to find anything that captures your interest for, like, more than an hour? Um, no, I've been catching up. Like, you know, I can use the excuse that I need to be up to date on television. Right. <laughs> uh, for my, cause of my job. So I've been catching up on a bunch of series that I should have watched a while ago. You know, I feel, I feel betrayed by television, honestly, because I thought we should have, we're all going to be outside, like fighting for cans of food and, you know, siphoning gas from one another. And instead we're all just at home. Well, yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, on, yeah. On Instagram. Like, isn't that crazy? Like, none of us are like, you know, uh, in the alleyways heating up cans of beans. It's not. I. It's it's not. I am legend yet. You know. Yet. Um, yet. Wait. So, X. Yeah. What is the big blind spot that you have, like, in terms of your TV catalog that you've like taken the time now to catch up on? Uh, actually, lots. I, I did. Uh, I did the Outsider. I did a lot of the ones that I started with and then lost. So the Outsider, I, I started with and lost track yep. of. Yep. Yep. Um, Narco season two, Mexico. I yep. was able to do that. I got caught up on that. Um, you know what? I actually I did Westworld. I, Westworld was always those ones I heard about. And I knew nerds were really into. Same I here. Said, uh, yeah, and but I never got in. And I I did all I did all the seasons. So okay, I wait, all, wait, hold on, hold on. So what is the verdict? Because what we see again, neither of us have watched anything about Westworld. Don't really know anything about Westworld, but know that it's popular. The internet yeah. said that season one is excellent and everything past it, not so much. But then we've also heard people who are like, you have to watch every single episode and you have to like read my my fan blog and my <laughs> fan fiction and everything. So like, right, you know, right, where, right. where do you fall? Season one is really good. They ask some really, it gets, it gets interesting. Season two, I can understand why people got a little disappointed about it. And season three is definitely getting, now that they're actually in the future, what I find interesting about season three, because a lot of science fiction they avoid real life like that's why so many i don't know if they know they're doing it but by setting a, a lot of science fiction is like in military settings mm -hmm. right so which makes it so oh, okay it's a general and a captain and a, they, like the military is not going to change right probably ever right so th they get to avoid what's it like going out to get coffee right in the future <laughs> what's what's a day you know what i mean like just what is everyday life like in the future and this one they're dealing with that a lot more you know what i mean it's a little more like okay 
just everyday life in the future, which I which I find like on my nerd nerd nerd. Yeah, I find interesting. Well, and by um, the way, I've gone without mm. coffee for the last forty days, which has been just oh. not like you know giving it up for Lent or something like that. Obviously, but it's just <laughs> because uh, I just don't have that chance to walk across the street and go to a Dunkin' Donuts or something like that to have that human connection every morning. So you're saying that Westworld is avoiding the reality of today by having <laughs> people drink coffee. That's that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yes, I'm saying by people going outside they completely got it all wrong <laughs> don't you know the future is us never leaving our homes again do you know it's, what it's scary it's scary bro i just heard that two cats got it yeah, yeah. yeah. Must have heard that one. we saw that like, yesterday as well can, if the cats got can get the virus i don't know how we get out of this bro but also like what crazy. symptoms were the cats having mm. <laughs> made them take it in <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> x uh you know what we started off the quarantine watching and this is probably not the best idea but we watched chernobyl on hbo oh, which wow. which we were like yeah let's let's, let's get like as dark as possible <laughs> when we're just sitting inside <laughs> but but man i mean a phenomenal series but very very heavy yeah but now i'm like no, chasing that me, darkness. i gotta watch that i'm gonna put that i'm gonna put that on my list <laughs> you that's should i've forgotten that's when I had forgotten I hadn't watched it. So, yeah, uh, I'm going to do that. Can I just That's say, next. like, I'm sorry? <laughs> <laughs> um, have you been Have you been uh, thinking about what the future holds in terms of, like, film sets in the next, like, six months? Because this is something we think about a lot. You know, you're not going to have a lot of people congregating near each other. What is, you know, a film set going to be? Is it going to be, like, very, very skeletal? Is it going to be, like, all green screen? Yeah. Like, is what? it a lot of animation moving forward? Where are we at? I really don't know. I'm getting calls now and people are trying to figure out how to shoot new content, you know, kind of remotely. Is that us? You know, <laughs> <laughs> are these phone calls no, no, I mean, us? like... <laughs> <laughs> just real like you know can we get a camera in there can we get a cameraman like it's not easy trying yeah. to figure this out if you want to do the quality and it's um it's going to be a minute it's going to be a minute to where I don't know this is really crazy stuff this is really crazy what is the the shortest amount of time that someone has given you to prep for either a music video or or a TV episode or a film oh a music video I mean I've shot in things like like the next day that just I've done music videos are the, the breeding ground for insane <laughs> requests so you know it, it's stuff like that but uh, like I did a two chains video like two chains video I did with Drake yep our call time our call time was five o'clock in the afternoon because I had to spend the morning actually getting the crew Jesus right so where'd you shoot yeah, that yeah yeah in LA somewhere yeah <laughs> it was madness but we, we, we had like tw- uh, 24 hour maybe 26 hours to prep that job so insane insane thing but I mean, like I said, music business, we always do the same. But do you even, like, walk in, like, when they when they approach you and they're like, hey, like, we have 2 chains, we have Drake, do you come in there with ideas, or is it just, like, just get the crew and then figure it out on the spot? No, you gotta have a concept. You gotta have a, you have to have a treatment that you're gonna be working with. I don't know you if you've to. seen a lot of music videos, but some of them do not have <laughs> concepts. <laughs> yeah, I know a lot of them are, I know a lot of them are not, are not up, to, up, to, up to par, but, um... <laughs> Um, you know, ex last week, you. last week we spoke with your great friend, uh, Tanisha Scott, and she, you know, is, is just a very special soul and a great person. What do you think is, is the key to your guys' creative success, um, over the last, you know, 20 years? Um, I don't know. We speak the same language coming from the same town. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, of course, creativity just matches creativity as well. So we have that side of ourselves. And uh, I don't know, just some things connect, some things click, and we're we got that kind of kind of relationship. And what made you call her in the first place? Because she said that you know she felt like she was on one trajectory, and then you were like, "Hey, can you come and choreograph this video?" And she was like, "But I'm a dancer," and you're like, "Let's just do this." Yeah, I mean, uh, some people don't think you know. I, I suffered from the same thing. I remember when I was younger, like, "Oh, I don't know how to do that because I haven't done it." And mm-hmm. someone else normally, sometimes someone else has to come along and say, what are you talking about? Just, just do it. Shut up. And, uh, <laughs> it, it, was, it was one of those things. You know, I, I've seen Drake's house now, uh, thanks to the, the Tusi slide video. Um, I don't know how far away you live from him. Have you been to his house and have you stolen anything? Because he definitely wouldn't notice. <laughs> right. I've definitely been to the house. I haven't stolen anything, but I spent a lot of time trying to find, uh, I'm always trying to find the, 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 the secret entrance to the Batcave. Oh, my God. Because, um, 
you know, people in Toronto don't talk about it much, but there's been a crime fighter ever since Drake uh, got got big. There's been this guy fighting crime around town, and um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put the pieces together. I'm pretty <laughs> I know, sure. By the way, I know who it is. <laughs> it's, it's Obi it's, O'Brien. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean that's. I would love if X like spent his entire quarantine really trying to figure this out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm so disappointed that no billionaire has actually gone to Bruce Wayne route. I'm, I'm like, because Jeff Bezos has definitely gone the Lex Luthor route. Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, who who says I'm the richest man in the world? Let me do the Lex Luthor look. <laughs> like, <laughs> I just saw that he uh, the the Whole Foods like cashiers are now wearing T-shirts that say "Hero" on the front and like uh, something else on the back, like. Um, like intense or something yeah and it's just like just pay them like they don't have to <laughs> they don't have to yeah. wear your dumb like you know words <laughs> to make oh, them feel yeah. better uh, yeah yeah it's 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 literally insane like when you really start digging into the crazy stuff that those guys do you're like wow wow they just I'm, sometimes i look at the things i'm like do you just want to be eaten are you are, do you want the people to rise up and try to like what are you this yeah. must be part of the dream so do but, you uh, x do you do you like on you know, in a pre-COVID world, were you there for uh, those types of films where it is about the uprising and it is about people in the streets and, you know, sort of uh, uprisings and all of that? Yeah, look, I paid a lot of attention. So I thought that's where this was going to go, um, especially like, you know, the Yellow Vest movement in France. Yep. Mm-hmm. There's a massive uh, worker strike along the border in Mexico that no one reported on. But that was what was going on. Like there's a lot of um, the world was really bubbling over everywhere. You know, of course, you know, China, the, the demonstrations that they were having. Um, and, the, and these weren't little protests. I mean, like the Yellow Vest protest in France was a year long. Yeah. And, and very French, like, OK, during the week we work and on the weekends we ride. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, like the, the coyote and the, and the roadrunner when they would punch in that cartoon. <laughs> yeah. The cartoon. Yep. They're punching for work. Yeah. But um, so I, I was expecting this, but God is the best writer so i didn't i didn't see global pandemic shutting down everything to really expose the lie right oh yeah so you're saying oh yeah we can't afford to fix the water pipes in flint oh my god pandemic comes along we're like hey airlines yeah i just found like a a zillion dollars yeah yeah yeah, it was just like behind the couch but (laughs) yeah exactly but there's like, always money. There's always money for them and none none for us right for the people right and now they can't they can't continue the lie and uh, I mean, and, and even the bigger lie was I'm I'm tired of even playing any of it. Like, oh, you can't print money because then that means that the money means let, oh it's yeah, all make, it's all make believe anyways. So yeah, shut up. well, so is status. Like, like all of it is dumb. Like, and then uh, I just saw that uh, the the global population of of poverty uh, of impoverished is going to double in the next like couple years or something, where it's going to be two hundred seventy five yeah. million dollars. Two hundred seventy five million yeah. people can't like find any food. Yeah, it's so, just. It's it's too much to comprehend, and and that idea that like money is meaningless is a big thing on on our minds and so many people here, you know. Yeah, because it's ultimate. Like I, I do this example with my buddy. Like if you're playing uh, Monopoly, and I came over with Monopoly Two, and we just combined the money, we wouldn't break out our calculator and say, okay, well now that we have double the hundreds, that means the hundreds are not worth the hundred anymore. The hundreds are really worth. So we let's recalculate the print. We went. We just say, okay, we just got a bunch more hundreds. We just yeah. got a bunch more fifties. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. So if we so desire to say that about our economy, I know economists are like, you don't know anything. Shut up. <laughs> it, it, as, as of the point is, it's all imaginary. And even the rules that we make about are imaginary, and that should not get in the way of people eating. Yeah. Oh my god, have you gotten to the point now where like updates on your phone are just not even shocking anymore? Oh yeah, I mean, and again, I'm I'm always watching the news. You know, um, it's, it's hard. I get spent, especially since so I went online. And I, and I made a video about herbal medicine. Like, hey, I, I take lots of herbs for my mm-hmm, skin and mm-hmm. I help my friends. So when things were getting crazy, I said, let me, I know a few things people might not know. I don't talk about it. But hey, made a little video and said, hey, you know, turmeric, there's a bunch of antiviral herbs. And then the the normies all came at me like I just told people, like, just drink holy water and you'll be fine. Like, they just attacked <laughs> me. So, um, but ever since then, people are like, oh, you're with us. And now I just get tons of conspiracy theory videos. So I'm over, I'm not as much overloaded by real life things as much as I am by the conspiracy theories. Because there's just so many. Just every time I turn around, 
I don't know what I'm, it's, you know, it's a doctor saying that it's fake. And then it's a nurse saying that they're doing this. And then it's a, this guy saying that it's the, and that's the 5G. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It, it, Everybody's every, got a cousin uh, <laughs> that was affected by the 5G towers and another cousin on the other side that uh, works, works in the, the Pentagon. Pentagon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, yeah, exactly. You know, I, exactly. I, I love that you've always attracted the crazies, uh, especially like on Instagram live. <laughs> you seem to have every single day, these arguments with people people who think the earth is flat <laughs> and you, it's like you trying to first. it's like you trying to educate people on like 50 years of or like you know millions of years of science but just like just the conversations that you have are just infuriating and i don't understand how your blood pressure <laughs> has remained like you're so zen and yet you have to deal with like idiots well, I know. I, one, I like debating, so there's just that part of it. Mm-hmm. I, I like. I just enjoy the debate. But something I did realize in, in debating the flat earthers is what it what it dawned on me was that the those those types like the flat earthers and the Illuminati guys they're never interested in actual conspiracies that could get them in trouble. And it hit me one day. Go, oh wow, man, you're really into flat Earth and like spreading the truth about. Uh, what's going on with the government can you link me to your (laughs) anti um uh you know pipeline like your dakota access pipeline page or maybe could you send me a link to your anti-drone strike page or maybe a link to your anti-wiretapping page because if you're so if you're on this flat earth you must be all over like black lives matter (laughs) you must be there's somebody right and and the guy literally said oh other people do that (laughs) because Yeah, I've got my own thing. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not doing that. And then I go, I called them out because you're not risking anything. Right. And and I and I start calling all all those conspiracy guys. Like, don't confuse yourself with actual journalists who end up dead. Yeah. Who get thrown out of windows for exposing things. Don't compare yourself to what's going on in South America or the people who you know uh, the fact that they changed the law. That's they've you know eco terrorist is now a term. Mm. But that now puts you, since terrorist is in there, so you're out, you know, uh, protesting a pipeline, and if they deem you an eco terrorist, you're a terrorist. That's nuts. And yeah, so they don't need to. And remember, they uh, it was Obama who uh, repealed habeas corpus. Yeah, you don't need you, you. don't get a lawyer anymore. You don't get you don't like all those those rights you thought you had don't exist if you're a terrorist. So you're out there fighting, you know, to keep your water clean. And then you're locked up for indefinitely. Like these are real risks, and people know it, which is why they get to have they get to have the fun. Which is why I don't really go after flat earthers anymore, because um, the flip side is true on me. I'm fighting flat earthers and avoiding having a larger fight. Mm-hmm. So, but that that's always the case. If you really want to shut up a conspiracy theorist, like, oh man, wow, you're really about this. Tell me about the South American coup in Venezuela. What? Uh, what? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me about Bolivia. You must really be concerned about the last election in Bolivia. Right. Uh, yeah, they, they have nothing to say. They don't know any. And those are the real conspiracy theories, which is even the thing about this, when people are like, oh, this is all fake, and this obviously, the, the pandemic is a thing, and they want to keep us inside. No, they're not. The, the oil, they're not making money on oil, and oil is what they start the wars for. Right. It's a real easy way to track what the conspiracy is. Is oil, is do, do the oil people make money? No, then this ain't fake. Right. It's actually quite the opposite. I, oil is like, you know, worth nothing at this point, you know? They're, they're paying you to store it. Right, right. Which, by the way, would probably be a good business plan for Eric and myself. Like, if we just started <laughs> hoarding oil, <laughs> instead of doing this podcast, I think we'd make a lot more money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just waiting for the world to turn back on. Well, yeah. Yeah, X, yeah. let me ask you this. Do Okay, we, we understand that, that we see the trends and the, and the world has been mm-hmm. getting... Cra- not not crazier meaning like well I mean yes there there are a lot of crazies out there but I mean like it's been a lot more hectic right we can see that there's been uprisings people are getting involved people are really like not happy with the institutions all of that do you have a plan for yourself if things go wrong uh, bikes and tents and uh, northern Canada where there's the water <laughs> and, uh, well, yeah. a force a force you can relieve yourself in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, the most important thing that you have that we don't is access to Canada right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, getting getting to a place where you can live off the land, I guess. But uh, I don't I don't know. I don't think anything's safe. What I do know, do you remember the blackout? What, or was it a decade ago now? In New York? Yeah, when yeah. New York, Toronto got it. We all, we all got, the whole East Coast got hit. Mm. Um, 
that's really the eye-opening thing for me was we don't really need electricity we'll we'll figure everything out the thing we need is the plumbing if the plumbing goes that's when we're that's when it's over that's when it's over if we can't flush the toilets forget it bro leave the leave the city okay so things things to watch out for plumbing mm-hmm. um uh, oil <laughs> mm-hmm. and we need oh, yeah. to, and we need to watch uh director x's instagram live got it yeah. okay yeah. understood yeah, well, yeah, i was exactly. gonna say chernobyl but you know <laughs> right totally and waste management two things cause i've been i've been in toronto for the for the garbage strikes let me tell you bro the waste waste management is really what this whole thing we, we can we'll get along with everything else we'll figure out how to eat you don't really need we don't need a lot of stuff human beings lived a long time without uh electricity yeah but we yeah but did to humans live a long trash. time without uh snacks from uh <laughs> from whole foods yeah <laughs> yeah well listen yeah exactly uh x we love you we appreciate you uh keep keep going on instagram live keep fighting the good fight and uh st- <laughs> stay healthy up there uh we'll be checking in with you and uh and until then be well all right all right man appreciate you guys shout out to director x shout out to marlon craft and shout out to salam remy jeff are we back tomorrow we are back every day forever as always guys not for real for real sure sure we'll see you guys tomorrow